Okay, the unfruitful Christian. The unfruitful Christian. We're going to be looking at the parable of the sower today and getting a reminder of uh, the different reasons why people are unfruitful in their Christian life. We'll look at a bit more of that in depth. But the analogy of fruit in the Bible is used a lot. Right? And obviously you can have good fruit and you can have bad fruit. But fruit, when, the, when we're talking about a Christian being fruitful, the positive aspects of fruit, uh, you think about why is fruit uh, a positive thing, even on a, a physical tree? I mean, a fruit represents like the blessing that that tree you know, will give to others. It provides nourishment, doesn't it? Being, have, bringing forth fruit on that tree. It's what you can eat on that tree. It's what's beneficial to us as humans. But not only does it, is it a blessing, not only does it provide nourishment, but it also enables reproduction, right? So fruit, being fruitful in the Bible is not only about you know, positive characteristics and love and whatnot, it's also about us duplicating one another, just like the Bible says in Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply is about having physical children where we be fruitful and multiply spiritually is where we get other people saved. Right? We are helping others to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we are making disciples of God's people. This is being fruitful and multiplying spiritually. So fruit is this positive analogy uh, that is used in the Bible of being productive for the Lord, doing things for the Lord, getting other people saved and growing the kingdom of God. Now God wants fruitful Christians. He wants, his, he wants his people to be fruitful. John 15, 8. Look at this. Herein is my Father glorified. You say, isn't it our purpose to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and glorify God? Yes. Herein is my Father glorified. Here's how you glorify God. That ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Right? So shall ye be my disciples. A fruitful Christian. Matthew 21, look at this. Now in the morning, as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. You know, some people, you know, they, they have uh, plants in their homes and they have it there just to look nice. It's a decoration. It's got leaves, it's got flowers, it looks good, but it's not always a fruit tree. It's, God doesn't like this. God doesn't want just beautiful trees with just a lot of leaves. He's after fruit trees. And here Jesus is hungry. He goes to this fig tree and he came to it. He found nothing thereon, talking about the fruit, but leaves only. And said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. So there's an analogy here, obviously, of the fig tree representing Israel. He's cursing the fig, fig tree. But here we see he comes to a tree. He wants a fruitful tree. And just like here, it refers to the nation of Israel, in your own life as well, he wants you to bear much fruit, like we read in John 15, 5. Look at this in Luke 13. Luke 13, verse 6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. So you see here, this is God coming like he sought fruit on the fig tree that he cursed. He wants a fruitful tree, just like he wants fruitful Christians. Verse 7, Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. So then he's patient with the tree, right? He's given the tree a chance to grow. But look, after three years, he says here, Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Right, so we see here this parable, and there's another meaning to it, but what I wanted to show you from this parable is, is God is coming and seeking fruit. And when he comes these three years and there's no fruit being coming out of this tree, he says, hey, cut it down. Why? Why cumbereth it the ground? And what I want you to reflect on here is there's no neutral position in the Christian life. So you're either gathering with the Lord Jesus Christ or you're scattering. And it's the same with bearing fruit. If you're not bearing fruit 
as a Christian, if you're not striving like the branch to bear fruit, being purged of God, bringing forth more fruit, if you're not heading in that direction, generally you're not just staying still. You're actually starting to go backwards. And in fact, your impact on the ground, there is an impact on the ground as well. See how it says here. He says, I come... Behold these three years, verse 7, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none, cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? So you would think, hey, well, this tree that's sitting in the ground, hey, just leave it there, it's not doing anything wrong. But that's not how God sees it. God's saying, no, it's actually cumbering. Why even let this tree take up resources and all this? So if you think about a tree in a garden, it's not a neutral position. Like it takes up resources, it takes the sun of other things on the ground, its roots go in where others can't, cannot grow. So we need to think about our impact as a Christian. If we are unfruitful, we don't want to be like this tree, cumbering, cumbering the ground, right? We want to be a tree that is useful, that is bringing forth fruit. Now what happens in the parable of the sower here in Mark 4 verse 3 onwards? We'll just go over it very quickly. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. So we've got somebody here going out, casting seeds, right? It came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up, right? So they're not going into the ground. Oftentimes in these pictures and cartoons, it's like kind of on the pathway, not able to go into the ground. And then the birds come and they eat those seeds. Verse 5, some fell on stony ground. So these are the different types of ground now that this seed is falling on. Some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. So this is springing up very quickly, right? Because it doesn't have to go in very deep. Verse 6, but when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. So the sun comes up and basically destroys those plants that do not, are not able to get in deep into the ground because of the stony ground. Verse 7, Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. So this is where they're trying to grow up because when it's growing amongst thorns, kind of like you know when we talked about the tree cumbering thing, cumbering thing in the ground, uh, that cumbereth the ground, these thorns that are growing up not only are choking and not allowing sunlight and all that, but also, you know, I'm sure it's taking up a lot of the space where the roots would need to grow as well. Verse 8, And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth, some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. Right, so the parable is basically giving these four scenarios of seed falling on the ground. You've got the one falling by the wayside. You've got the one falling on stony ground. Then the one falling among thorns. And then lastly, you have the one falling on good ground. Now, different people understand this parable differently. And the thing is, we don't really need to wonder what these different scenarios represent because this is a parable where Jesus actually explains what this parable represents. Represents. But one thing I just wanted to touch on today is the danger of misusing parables. Like parables, you've got to remember, are stories. In the Bible, you have, you have two testaments, right? You have two uh, sections of books. You've got the Old Testament and you've got the New Testament. So you have a New Testament covenant, you have an Old Testament covenant. So not only that, but in the Bible, you have stories and you have statements. Now, parables will fit into that category of stories that are being told that need to be interpreted in light of the true and definite statements that are in the Bible. This is often why false doctrine is used to promote false doctrine, right? They use parables to promote false doctrine because parables can be interpreted. Now, some parables are interpreted for us in the Bible. Others are given, and then we, through our study of the Bible, need to figure out what that parable means. But what you have to understand in the Bible is you have stories and you have statements, and you have to interpret the stories in the Bible with statements. It's like quotes, like we talked about uh, last week, when we talked about you know, the, the chief priest saying things, just because they said something, that doesn't mean it's true. We need to use the statements in the Bible to see, is this actually a truth that is being said. So it's the same with parables. And I, I just want to show you these two Proverbs in Proverbs 26. It talks about, you know, the danger of a parable in the mouth of a fool, right? The legs of the lame are not equal. 
so is a parable in the mouth of fools. So you can see here parables can be misused. They can be misunderstood. So what is it saying here in verse 7? It's saying just like the legs of a lame person are not the same as the legs of somebody who is fit and strong, it's the same when a fool uses a parable and a wise man uses a parable. They're not the same thing. Just because they're both using a parable to prove their point, that doesn't mean they're equal. Right? That's the first one, verse 7. Verse 9, it says, As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. So you say, wonder, what does that mean? A parable in the mouth of fools is like a, a drunkard that doesn't realize a thorn has just spiked himself through the hand. And what I think this is talking about here is, if a fool, or if a person uses, I guess, a parable foolishly, they don't always realize that the damage that they're doing to themselves. Right? Think about the people that believe in a work salvation and they think they've got all the explanations and they go to parables like the parable of the sower. Right? And they use the parable of the sower to promote a work salvation and they say, oh, see, if you don't bring forth fruit, you don't have the works, you're not saved. And they don't even realize it's like a thorn's going up in their own hand because they're condemning themselves with their own, in, in, in their own interpretation or how they understand this parable. So you can see how a parable in the mouth of a fool Somebody that doesn't understand you know, the statements and the doctrine in the Bible using a parable, they don't even realize that they're hurting themselves. That's how I got to kind of get this problem. As a thorn goeth up into the hand of a drunkard. Right? He's drunk, doesn't even realize he's hurt himself. Not all parables used by people are equal. That's basically what I'm saying here. So there is a danger of misusing a parable right? and getting the wrong understanding. But this is one where we don't have to wonder what the parable means because Jesus gives us the meaning of this parable in the Bible. And that's what we're going to go through today. We're going to look at the four different scenarios. We're going to talk about them. And I want you guys to just reflect on your own spiritual life. You know, because we don't want to be unfruitful Christians, right? We want to be fruitful in our life. So these are the different reasons. The parable of the sower is basically a parable explaining the reasons why people are unfruitful. So which will apply to you today? Let's have a look at them. Number one is the seed by the wayside. The seed by the wayside. And as we talk about these different parables, or these different situations, I want you to see that there is the primary application of the parable, which is how Jesus explains, which is actually the word, the seed being the word of God, being sown into somebody's heart, and how they respond to that seed sown into their heart. But I also want to draw a secondary application as well because I feel that these different scenarios also can apply to the Christian himself, whether it's the scenario that he finds himself in church or out of church. Right? So you can think of it as the Word of God, the seed sown in the heart, which is what Jesus is explaining. But what I find as well, it also is a strong application to the Christian. If you think about the Christian as a seed and whether he is firmly planted in the ground or not. So the first one is by the wayside. So the primary application is that you are not yet saved. That's one reason why you are not fruitful, is because you, do, you are not saved. You have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people are still trusting work salvation. right? Some people are still believing the wrong thing and they're not actually saved. Some people just do not yet, have not yet put their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 4.15 it says, these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now, how do we know that this first scenario is talking about people that are not saved? Well, we compare this to Luke 8, where we have a parallel passage of the parable of the sower. We get some more insight into what this first scenario is. Luke 8, verse 12. Those by the wayside are they that hear... Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. Look at this. Lest they should believe and be saved. Right? So you see how the word going into the ground, into the heart, is the person receiving the word of God and being saved. And we see here the comparison to the ones that fell on the rock. They on the rock are they which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe. So you see, these people have believed, they've received the word, but, you know, like we go from faith to faith, we may receive the word by faith 
but if they do not grow in the way, this is why the Bible talks about for a while they believe. Because some people, they get out of the faith, right? And they get back in, but this is not anything to do with your salvation. And in time of temptation, fall away. So the, the, so the fact that it's sprung up, that person was born again, right? That plant is now sprung up, but the sun came up and it withered it away. So this is how we know the first scenario is somebody that is not saved. They didn't receive the word. They didn't believe and be saved. And you see, a tree that doesn't even exist cannot bring forth fruit. And you say, yeah, well, people go to church. They're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to do good. Are they not being fruitful? No. Well, the Bible says here in Isaiah 64, 6, but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. See, why is it that you may look at somebody and say, hey, they're, doing all, they're, they're trying to go to church, trying to be loving to people, trying to do the right thing. Why is this still sin in God's eyes? Because our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Now, why is that? Well, Hebrews eleven six tells us, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, we don't believe the right things. Right? If we're not saved, then everything we do is not always done for the right reason. Right? And the Bible says here we don't serve God in faith. We don't serve God with the right mentality, right? with the truth. Then this is how we cannot please him. The Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please him. It's not that sometimes you please him and sometimes you don't. The Bible says in verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. Romans 14, 23, look at this. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You see, the person that is not saved, does not believe on the Bible, does not believe on God's word, does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the word made flesh, Right? You need to believe God's word and do things by faith in order to please God. And the unsaved person is not doing things in faith, in God's word. Right? Like everybody has faith. Everybody believes something. The problem is we need the right faith. The faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Let's look at Matthew 7. Matthew 7 verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. We'll talk about that phrase in a moment. Doing the will of the Father. It's not saying, so what it's saying here in verse 21, it's not just everyone that makes Jesus their Lord goes to heaven. Right? But it's the people that do what God wants. Right? So there is a way to get to heaven. Right? It's not just people that make Jesus their Lord. They say, Lord, Lord. Verse 22, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. You see, when people believe on work salvation, here are people that are doing what people, I guess if you didn't know their heart, you would look at them and you'd think they're doing lots of good things for God. I mean, they're casting out devils. I mean, they're teaching in Jesus' name. They're doing many wonderful works in his name. I mean, who knows if that's social work or charity work or even miracles in Jesus' name. Verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So remember, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Remember, like, it's impossible to please him. So why did these things not please God? Why would he look at these works? And these guys were not even saved because, first of all, they were trusting their works, as we can see from this, because if Jesus doesn't let you into heaven and the first thing you say is, look at all these things I did, obviously... You're not trusting in your works because if you were saved, the first thing you would say is, but you're my saviour, you died for me. But he says here in verse 23, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Right, so some people say that, well, it's because these people, it's because they weren't really doing good works and they were fornicating and they were doing all this, you know, sinning and they were drunkards and things like that. That's not what they're saying, right? It's because they were doing all these things not in faith. Right? And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's why Jesus can say to them, all these works that they thought were good, he said, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, because their righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So how do people enter into the kingdom of heaven? Look at this. It says, 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So what is this will of the Father that gets you into heaven? Is it, is it work salvation? You know, do we contradict the whole reason why Jesus Christ came to die on the cross for our sins, that we might believe on him and be saved by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast? No. Let's look at John 3. John 3 is where Jesus himself is explaining to Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, what, it, what will of God you have to do in order to be saved and enter into the kingdom of God. John 3, 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, so he's coming to Jesus by night because he's obviously worried about what all the other Pharisees think. He's kind of doing it in secret. And he himself believes. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, so verily means truly, truly I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you see how this is how you get into the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. Now Nicodemus misunderstands him. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So you see how Nicodemus is not focused. He doesn't understand this spiritual birth. Right, what that Jesus is talking about. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Is he going to get born fleshly the second time? He's going to climb back into his mother's womb and then come out again? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So a lot of people misunderstand verse 5. They think that's talking about baptism. No, is, there, is there anything about baptism in this verse? No, he's talking about a fleshly birth. So he's talking about the first fleshly birth. Nicodemus thinks it's two fleshly births. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The second birth is a spiritual birth. That's why the first birth, which is the water birth, coming out of your mother's womb, and the second birth is the spiritual birth, which is being born of the Spirit. So that's what being born of water and of the Spirit means. He cannot enter, look at this, into the kingdom of God. So this is how you enter into the kingdom of God. You must be born again. He clarifies in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. So you see the, 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 the parallel there between verse 5. You've got born of the water and of the spirit. And then in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's your first physical birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's being born again of God's spirit. Verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, what is he saying here? He's saying the wind blows where it wants, listeth like where it desires, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So whence is from, from where, whither is to, to where, right? So from, from here and uh, whither is to there. From whence it cometh and whither it goeth, to where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So that's something that I learned reading this verse, saying, ah, you know, that's, this is why you can hear the Spirit of God, but you can't see it. You can hear people's Spirit, but you can't see their Spirit. And this is why the, the Spirit of God is the Word of God. When you're hearing the Word of God, you are hearing the Spirit of God go through this body of believers here today as we read through these words. Verse 19, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Right? So he doesn't understand the physical birth, the spiritual birth. But Jesus answered him and said unto him, Art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? So Jesus expected those that knew the Bible and were teachers in Israel to know these things. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not our witness. So it's saying that Jesus, obviously he's preaching about things, the things of God. It says, if I have told you of earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So what he's talking about here is he's telling him about, hey, the things that happen on earth, the physical birth, the spiritual birth, you know, the believing on Jesus Christ, the things that he's going to go through in order for people to be saved. And Nicodemus is questioning these things and Jesus says, hey, well, I'm telling you about the things that are happening on the earth. How are you going to believe the things when I tell you about things that happen in heaven? 
And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. For verse 13 shows us that Jesus Christ is omnipresent. All right, we learned about this this morning, kids. Omnipresent means he's everywhere. That Jesus, even though he's talking to Nicodemus here in John 13, he's also up in heaven at the same time, which is in heaven. Verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So if you remember in, in Numbers, I believe it was, when Moses lifted up the brazen serpent, because people were getting bitten by these vipers, but if they looked at the serpent, they were saved. So he's likening here, Jesus is saying, hey, that serpent that was lifted up, that was a representation of him being lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So you see, how do you do the will of God to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Well, you need to be born again. How are you born again? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You believe on the only begotten Son of God. So you won't perish, but you have eternal life. Right, so that's the primary application of by the wayside. Is it, you, you may not be fruitful because you may not even be saved yet. Right, you need to be saved in order to be fruitful. But there's a second application as well, like I said, with the actual believer, where he is. And when I think about believers that fall by the wayside, these are people that get out of church. These are people that get out of the pillar and ground of the truth. They do not sink their roots in. They don't start growing and they're not going to be fruitful, right? Because as a believer, they are falling by the wayside. And that's why the Bible says, you know, the, the, uh, our adversary, the devil, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Right? Seeking whom, remember the birds of the air came and devoured up the sea, just like he takes the word out of your heart. But like the Christian, getting out of God's house, getting into the world, lets himself or herself get devoured. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So if you think of the church like a garden bed, like a ground that seed needs to be sown into, and if the seed falls by the wayside, they get out of God's house, they do not end up being fruitful. You know, a lot of people will say, you know, when you encourage them to come to church, you say, hey, you've got to be in church, you've got to get in God's house, you've got to get serving. You know what some people will say, they don't have the right mindset, they'll say, well, do I need to go to church to love God? Do I need to go to church to serve God? Do I need to go to church to, to grow and to learn? Well, show me somebody that's out of church that is growing. Show me, show me somebody out of church that's doing great things for God, that's not fellowshipping and serving in God's house. I'm not saying it has to be this house, but they're somewhere there. They're with God's people, right? So this is a crucial part of your spiritual growth is that you are planted in the house of God, serving God amongst God's people, growing, right? And it's not always easy to grow. And uh, we'll talk about that a bit later on. Okay, so that's the first scenario. By the wayside, second scenario, the stony ground. Stony ground, Mark 4, 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. These are people, they get excited. Very easy, they grow. You know, they start sprouting up. You start to see some growth in their life. But verse 17, have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake. So this is what the Son represented. The sun represented trials and tribulations in their life. Persecution, maybe ridicule, maybe getting outcasted. Ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And you know what? I used to think like, hey, maybe this parable here, this situation here is people that come in, church, they get a bit excited after a few weeks, they're gone. Or the people that come in, they get excited after a few months, they're gone. But then what I start to realize in my own life and I start to see in other people's lives 
is no, sometimes these are people that get excited over a couple of years and then they get out, right? Because Christianity is not measured in weeks, in months, in years. Christianity is measured in decades, right? Because Christianity is a lifetime pursuit, right? And we don't want to quit the race, right? We want to finish our course with joy. But oftentimes people, you know, they get in, couple of years, they're certain, they're excited, and then three, four, five years later, they get out. It's a bit like that tree that's cumbering the ground, right? It comes three years, and people get out. So this scenario doesn't always happen overnight, you know? So you need to take heed to yourself, right? Are you growing? You know, because after a couple of years, when things start to become familiar, and you're not growing anymore because you're not trying to get your roots deeper, not trying to bring forth more fruit, you may end up being offended as well when persecution and tribulations and trials arise, when things start getting tough. So you have the primary application here, which is, what does this stony, the, the thing on the stony ground represent? Well, it represents that the person has, like, lacks a deeper understanding. You know, has a sense of purpose, knows why they do things, right? 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, you as a Christian have to continuously be growing, not only in grace, but in truth. Growing in knowledge. If you stagnate in learning and growing, you're going to stagnate your growth for the Lord as well. So you lack a deeper understanding, right? Sometimes people, they just know very surface level knowledge. They don't understand, you know, not only what they believe, but you need to understand why you believe it. You need to be able to defend what you believe. You need to have a sense of purpose and, and remember why we are on this earth, right? And the deeper that understanding goes, that root, those roots can go into the ground, right, into your heart. The deeper God's word goes into your heart. Notice how in Mark 4, how he says, verse 17, they have no root in themselves, right? So it starts with yourself. How much are you going to internalize God's word? How much are you going to study God's word? How much are you going to understand God's word? How much God's word going to affect you? How much are you going to make it a part of your life? Right? Sometimes people, the only Bible they get is when they hear it at church. When they live their life, all the other six days of the week, they don't take even a second thought for God's Word. How God's Word applies in their life, putting God at the front of their life. Of course you're not going to grow because you're not getting down deep. So when persecution arises for the Word's sake, immediately are offended. When times get hard. 1 Peter 3, 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. We talked a bit about this last week. You know, people getting offended because of the hard times they come through, but we should expect that hard times will come, that Christian life is not easy. Verse 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And just like God does not want fruitless Christians, unfruitful Christians. He doesn't want ignorant Christians either. You know, we ought to be growing not only in grace, like I said, but in knowledge. You don't want to be ignorant of God's word. You need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Obviously having the right attitude about it as well. And this takes work. This takes study. This is why 2 Timothy 2 says you've got to study to show yourself approved of unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Ashamed is when people ask you why you believe something, ask you questions, you go, and you can't defend it. Right? You're ashamed of what you believe. You're ashamed. You, don't, you don't stand there boldly and know what you believe. But if you study to show yourself approved, you're going to be ready always to give an answer. And when that time comes, when you need to have that conversation, you will be ready to bring forth some fruit, that might be an opportunity for you to get somebody saved. But if your understanding does not go deeper than surface level because your heart is a stony heart, right? It's not letting the Word of God go in deep, a deeper understanding, then you're not going to be as fruitful as you could be. Now, the second application, secondary application I want you to talk about, think about, is because, you know, the Christian and the Christian life. When I think about the Christian in terms of, okay, you're in church, 
When we talk about the roots going in deep, what can that represent? You know, that's talking about your deep deepness and your depth of the relationships in your church. Right? And the relationships are built, relationships are built in church, not only just time spent together, but it's also your service to one another, service in the church as well. You know, people that serve together, people that serve in church, the more you do in a church, the deeper those relationships are going to be. And the deeper those relationships are going to be, the easier it's going to be when you go through hard times. Not only will you have people there to support you, right, but then you're going to have people there to encourage you and, and provoke you onto love and to good works. Oftentimes it's easier getting out of church when you don't really know anyone. Right? When you come to church, you don't really make an effort to make friends or involve yourself in people's life. Then when you get out of church, it's easier to stay out of church. Like you don't know anyone anyway and things like that. Also, you need to think about it this way as well. Oftentimes, when you have stronger relationships in church, it'll be easier for you to deal with persecution and tribulation in the world. Right? Because if, if the people that may be making your life hard, persecuting, tribulation, or ridicule, outcasting you is the only circle of friends you have, you're going to worry a bit more right? about losing that circle of friends. You may compromise a bit more. But if you know you have a body of people that love you, that accept you, that serve with you, that believe like you do, you're going to be a bit more bold when it comes to being different in the world. So you see how the strength of your relationships in church can affect your fruitfulness as well as a believer. Look at what it says here in Matthew 13, uh, verse 53. Even Jesus himself, did you know even Jesus himself was not honoured by his near of kin and his countrymen? Look what it says here, and this is in some of the some of the Gospels, verse 53. It came to pass that when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed thence, and when he was come into, look at this, his own country. Right, so these are the people that he grew up with that know him very well. He said he taught them in their synagogue in so much that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph? And Simon and Judas. And why, why, do, why do generally the people that you know so well don't tend to respect you as, as, as much as others that have not grown up with you? Because they don't know your past. They don't know your failures. They don't know you as well. The people that know you better, you know, the things that you've gone through through your life, they tend to, you know, be harder to impress. Right? Verse 56, And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Verse 57, they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto them, look at this, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. What is he saying here in verse 57? He's saying a prophet should be honored, but usually a prophet does not have honor in his own country and in his own house. So I don't know if you noticed that's what it's saying. A prophet is not without honor. So saying a prophet always has honor except save in his own country and in his own house, the people that know him the most, the people that he grew up with, right? And even Jesus experienced that too. So that's why it's so important that you establish good relationships in church. You know, try and make friends, try and, you know, sort of sink your, sink your roots in to the community here because, you know, it's going to make you bolder when you're overcoming the trials and tribulations um, out in the relationships in the world, right? Uh, even at work or in the family and whatnot. Okay, so the more you grow your relationships at church, the less you're going to be bothered by the persecution outside of church. Uh, Hebrews 10. Not only that, like I said, the stronger you are in here, the more people are going to provoke and, 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 and uh, provoke you onto love and good works. I mean, when you try and encourage somebody, I know all of us, I'm sure all of us have tried to provoke somebody else, hopefully, onto love and good works. I mean, don't you do it with people that you know better, right? You're not just going to go up to a complete stranger, and, and hopefully you don't do this, right? Some people do do this, and they shouldn't, right? You just go up to people you hardly know, and just like you know, tell them off and rebuke them and provoke them to good love and good work. So the more you know people, the easier it is to bring up things where you might need to correct them. You might need to take the, the moat out of their eye. But you remember, you know, you're bold, you're the beam in your own eye. You've got to deal with your own beam first before you go around taking out other people's specs. But that's one thing that is part of the Christian life. Verse 23, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Right? That's our salvation there. Verse 24, 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Right? So this, it's a two-way thing, right, with the relationships in church. You get the support, but you also want to grow that relationship so that you can provoke others unto love and good works. Because you know what? You're going to be able to help people more, the better you know them. Number three now, the thorny ground. And this one probably applies to us most in a first world country where we have things so easy. We have things so easy. What is this thorns that the seed is growing among? Verse uh, 18, Mark 4. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things, entering in, choke the word, and becometh unfruitful. So you see how people are not automatically unfruitful. It's when they get tied up in too many of these things, they become unfruitful. It's something that you can stop but verse 19, what is it? The cares of this world. It's the burdens and the obligations and the commitments that we have in this world. Right? Sometimes it's just too much. The deceitfulness of riches. right? Deceiving you into thinking that's what you should be living for. By giving all your time and effort into making money and being comfortable rather than realizing, hey, there's an eternity that you have to live and you only have a brief moment in this life, but then you're deceived into thinking this life is all there is. Right? But you want to understand this life is not all there is. Here we are, we are to serve God and do things for God in this life, not just to serve ourselves. The deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things. Entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And when you reflect on it in your own life, I mean, we can fill our life with pleasures. Right? It's like Solomon. I mean, he can do all these things, and I'm sure there's plenty of things he didn't do, but he tried, he filled all his life with pleasures, and he told us how vain it was. But this is where people deceive themselves into thinking they're going to find fulfillment in the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things. I like how Luke 8 puts it. It says, That which fell among thorns are they, which when they've heard, go forth, so that's a, they spring up and are choked with cares and riches, and look at this, pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. You know, we have so many pleasures in this life, gadgets, gizmos, clothing, shoes, jewellery, holidays, just fun. You know, you always want to do something fun, you know, go out and just, you know, always enjoy, always making yourself feel good, get pampered and do all these things. The pleasures of this life. And sometimes when we focus too much on those things, we become unfruitful. Why? Because it chokes out the Word of God in your life and the Word of God doing great things in your life. Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. I think we need to hear this one again. Lay not up for yourselves Treasures upon earth. Because isn't that what we get caught up doing? We get worried, you know, we're trying to build up and amass and live a comfortable life. But the Bible says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. It's not, that's not the purpose of your life. Where moth and rust doth corrupt and where three thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. See, the things that you value, that's what you're going to be focused on. And you want to focus on the things of heaven, not on the things of this earth. But if you focus on the things of this earth, it's going to make you unfruitful. It's going to choke the word in your life. And if you have too much going on, that can definitely affect your fruitfulness as a Christian. So that's a primary application. just want to talk about the secondary application. So one is... Your heart, having a worldly heart. Things, you're set on the things of this world. You care about the things of this world more than you care about the things of God. But in your Christian, as a Christian as well, what can these thorns represent? It's just like excessive obligations and commitments. 
And just like thorns and weeds grow and they just multiply, and if you don't do anything about it, if you don't cut them out of the ground, they're just going to overcome you, obligations and commitments in your life grow as well. Right? You always have more family, more in-laws, more relatives, more like nephews and nieces and friends, kids and their kids. And there's always things that you can do and go to. There's going to be more we- as you get older. There's going to be more weddings, more birthdays, more anniversaries, more family get-togethers. Just grows and grows and grows. And these things can choke your ability and priority to do things for the Lord. And it's not only happens with things just of the world, things of family, but even, you know, we can get busy doing spiritual things too. This is why I try not to have too many social things, right? Because I just don't want a church that's just constantly doing things but not being fruitful, not spending time soul winning. Ecclesiastes 7.15 All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? You see, you can do too much in your life. There is more to do in this world than you have time for. Right? And you can't do everything. But you, you, know, you can fill your life with too much. Right? Where you just choke out and not prioritize the things of God. Right? So you need to prioritize your responsibilities. You need to know when to say no to things. Because you need to have priorities in your life and make sure you do the things that God wants you to do so you don't just fill your life with thorns and things that are going to choke the word. Look at Joshua 11, 15. As the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He, Joshua, left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. You know, I'm sure there there was a lot of things that Joshua wanted to accomplish in his life. I'm sure there's a lot of things that Joshua could have been doing with his time. But what did he make sure of? He made sure he left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded him. And this is why we need to keep God first. Make sure we are being fruitful as Christians. Make sure we're winning souls, learning, growing, establishing relationships in church because we want to be fruitful for the kingdom of God. But oftentimes, we spend our, time, our life doing a lot of things that may be good. You know, they may not be necessarily bad, but we just do too much of it. Right? So you do have thorns that can be bad things, but sometimes you just have too many leaves in your life. And all those leaves sometimes need to be pruned off in order to bring forth more fruit. So this life is not the time for selfishness and pleasure, right? This is a war that we're in. We have eternity to rest and enjoy life. Okay, don't forget that. This life is not about rest and relaxation and just living it up. This life is about service to God and being fruitful, right? We have all eternity to rest and relax. The last one. All right, Simon, Simon, don't muck around, please. The last one is good ground, right? So we have by the wayside, we have the stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good ground is the last one. Mark 4. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some and hundred. And the good ground is obviously the opposite of the other three, right? You're saved, you've got a deep understanding and good relationships, you know, strong roots in God, in your heart and in, in church. And uh, number three, you know, you've got your heart set on things above, right? The thorny ground is, is, the good ground is the opposite of the thorny ground. The thorns are not there, right? They have their heart set on the things of God. But there's a few things I just want to point out in Mark 4, and we'll go over to Luke 8 as well. But here we see as, it, as the Christian brings forth fruit, you notice that there are different amounts, right? And that's, and that's a good thing to reflect on, right? Is that, you know, when you compare yourself to other people, you're not all going to be the same. Some people are going to bring forth 30-fold. Some people are going to bring forth 60-fold. Some are 100-fold. We have different talents and we have different capabilities, right? We have different amounts of time as well. So you may look at somebody else and you may say, well, am I able to do as much as them? I'm not as capable. Well, are you doing what you can? 
You know, you may look at somebody else, you're more capable. You're saying, oh, they're doing that. I could do more. That means you should be doing more. Right? So we don't just compare ourselves to other people and get discouraged. We should be reflective and say, well, it depends. Am I doing as much as I can? Am I bringing forth the fruit that I am capable of? But notice here, different people are going to bring forth different amounts. Right? Some people, you know, are able to go to, like, to church multiple times a week. You know, in my situation, once is hard enough for me already. Right? So you have church, a number of times going to church. But think about soul winning, right? Some people go, well, soul winning, I can't go every week. Well, at least go once a month then. At least go once every two weeks. Do something, right? And then you'll have differing amounts of fruit that you bring forth. Right? So you don't always have to do the same as everyone else. But are you doing what you're able to do? That's what you really need to be reflecting on. So you have differing amounts of reproduction. But Luke 8, let's look at Luke 8 as well. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, right? So this is a heart that believes on God's word and wants to walk in God's word. Having heard the word, keep it. Right? So there's that not being a hearer only, but a doer of the word. Right, so obviously you're not going to bring forth fruit if you just hear what you need to do, but then you don't do it. Having heard the word, keep it, look at this, and bring forth fruit with patience. Now patience in the King James Bible is not just waiting around and waiting for something. Right? Patience is when you're busy serving and doing things, but then it's you know, there's tribulations and trials that you've got to work through, right? This is why the Bible talks about this is the patience of the saints, talking about, you know, end times tribulation. So when it comes, says you bring forth fruit with patience, it means it's going to be hard to be consistent and to keep doing it and keep going forward. It's going to require some diligence, some consistency, some hard work, right? And that's no different to tending to a garden, is it? When you tend to a garden, I mean, it requires work. You need to be diligent about the weeds. You need to, like my wife, you know, you've got to be diligent about those bugs that come, you know. You grow like that one, you know, that one fig, and then you've got to protect it, right? Otherwise, things are going to come. I remember, like, uh, Elizabeth, like, she put a plant, like, too low on the ground, and then our guinea pigs came and climbed up and, like, ate that plant. So, yes, it requires diligence. It requires consistency. It requires some hard work. So, don't get this idea in your mind that Christianity is easy. Christianity is not easy. Christianity is going to take hard work, diligence, and consistency. And that's what's going, to, what's going to take in order to bring forth fruit. You know, I see this in soul winning as well. Sometimes people come one week, and then they never come again. And then sometimes people come two weeks and three weeks, and then they never come. Oh, this doesn't work. Yeah, well, it's because you haven't got long enough. Right? You've got to go, and you've got to improve, you've got to get better. And the more people you talk to, you'll see the fruit come forth. Right? You'll get people saved. You'll talk to people and you'll be able to lead them to Jesus Christ the more that you're in it. Right? But the more you do it, the more fruit you're going to bring forth. So you're going to hear the word, you're going to do it, and when you bring forth fruit with patience, it means it's not going to be easy. Life is not easy. You know, when you become a Christian, life doesn't get any... In fact, oftentimes life gets harder <laughs> when you're a Christian. And getting people saved is not easy, affecting people's life. All right, a few questions I just want you to reflect on, just in closing, on these uh, four situations. So how is your heart this morning? This is what you want to reflect on when you think about the parable of the sower. You want to think, how, what is my heart like? First of all, are you saved? You need to make sure you say how you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, not your own dead works. Right? Are you saved? How is your church attendance? Are you consistent? to church how are you at church how do you enjoy coming to church hearing god's word how is your heart do you have a heart to want to know god more and to hear his word sing praises to him are you growing in your knowledge of god's word do you know more about the bible today than you did last year are you growing are you learning more are there things in the last year that you've learned that you didn't know before? And if you say, no, I just always know the things that I know, then you must be going backwards, right? You're not growing. Are you growing in your knowledge of God's Word? 
Do you know how to defend your faith and give answers to objections? Like some people only have a surface level knowledge of the doctrines that they believe. They say, I believe something, this is the verse, why I believe it, that's good enough. No, that's not good enough. Right? Because just because you know the verse for why you believe something, do you know how all the other verses in the Bible fit in with that doctrine? When somebody says to you, yeah, but what about this verse? Do you know, ah, well, this is how you understand it with this verse and with this verse, and this is how the whole picture comes together. That's when you have a good understanding of God's Word. You have a good understanding of God's Word on a certain topic when you know all the verses that are relevant to that topic and you know how it all fits together. You can explain them all. That's when you know you have a good knowledge. Because not only can you say, this is what I believe, but you can say, hey, this is what people might object to, what I believe and why I believe it. How are your relationships with the people of God? See, when you think about your closest circle of friends, what are they like? You know, the people that you, know, you, hang, you, know, you, you may talk a lot with, you may play with, when you think about hanging out, they're the people you call. What are they like? Do you know what I mean? Are they the people that are like growing and wanting to serve God? Do they encourage you to be at church? Do they encourage you in your Bible knowledge? Do they encourage you to win souls? Or are they drawing you away from God? Right? This is why it's important that you want to build relationships with people that are going to push you forward rather than backwards. What are the priorities in your life? When you think about what do I want to accomplish with my life? What am I living for? Do you think about that? Do you think about why you're here? Do you forget sometimes that you're here to serve the Lord, here to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ? When you think about the things you want to accomplish in your life, is God even on your radar? Do you love pleasure more than God? Right? Just filling your life with pleasures. Could you be doing more for God and less for yourself? You know, could you be rearranging your schedule so that you have more time to do more things for God rather than just filling your life with all the things that you want to do. Are you growing in your service to God? Are you doing more for God today than you were last year? These are things that you want to reflect on this morning because ultimately, are you being fruitful or are you becoming unfruitful? This is why the parable of the sower is always a good reminder. It's a good reminder for us to reflect on our own life because these different grounds, these are like factors that affect every Christian, right? Because sometimes, right, you may have, you know, times of a lapse of faith, right? Even if you're saved, you might, you know, get into times where you're wondering about things, and that's making you unfruitful. And then you may have times when, you know, you, you, you have trials and tribulations, you get discouraged from serving God. And then there are other times when you get caught away with this life. You get caught up with the rat race and you get caught up with this world and your job and your career and all the obligations you have in your life and then you forget your purpose. But we want to be on that good ground. We want to be fruitful. So we need to be aware of the things that make us unfruitful. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, thank you for blessing us. Thank you, Lord, that we are not worthy to be called your sons and daughters. We are not worthy, Lord, for your love, of your love, but we thank you that regardless, you love us anyway. And uh, Lord, we thank you and uh, just pray, Lord, that you help us, that the love of Christ would constrain us to go forth and, and do good works, Lord. Help us to uh, be fruitful and to multiply. And I pray, Lord, that if there are elements in our life where we are stony or thorny ground, help us, Lord, to be this good ground Help us to be fruitful. Uh, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.